everybody. This is Diane. Welcome back to Biters. And this is Marnell. Let's get this over with. I got a date. (laughs) I don't have anything special going on. I'm just herding moose. (laughs) That's right. How many moose on the way home? Oh, actually, it was a small number today. I had four. Oh, my goodness. One of them was in the middle of our back road that we turn on to to get to our house. So I followed it down the road for a bit before it decided to go off into our over five feet of snow in the last 10 days. Ugh. Ugh, you can you know, bet I, I am sick of snow. You know, what's worse, though? I, like, I, I'm kind of sick of, sick of snow, too. But, like, we've had just as much probably snow but it's snain so it doesn't stick so it comes down like there's a whiteout but none of it ever sticks so we don't get any accumulation well i have just, to tell you like three feet of snow in 48 hours this weekend i'm done <laughs> i know i live in alaska but i'm done right yeah where is climate change when you need it <laughs> well and the weird thing is is our snow came so late this year yeah, I was actually, the Facebook memories that keep coming up is um, we adopted Phoenix like four years ago, right around this time, or we, we started fostering her. And so it's a whole bunch of pictures and videos of her in our yard that was completely thawed out. It was all sunny. I had completely raped it, raked it of this. Uh, <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> right? I had raked it of all of the poopy from the winter. So like it was a nice clean yard. It was bright and sunny and it's like March 10th. I'm like, what, what, what's going on? I have like four feet of snow in my yard still. This is ridiculous. So we didn't have snow for so long that there was a lot of conversation about whether or not Iditarod was going to launch from Willow, which is where I live. Oh, um, because, and it hasn't for a while. No, it has. So okay. there have I, there been, I think there, I think there have been two years in the time that I've been following it that it launched from Fairbanks, but okay. um, all of the other, it's never canceled and all of the other years it actually has launched from Willow. So the ceremonial start is in Anchorage and then the restart is in Willow. Used to be in Wasilla, but as climate change has happened, it's, the restart has moved farther and farther north. But so we weren't sure that we were going to have enough snow. And then maybe 10 days ago, we got a good couple of feet and then we just got hammered this weekend. And this weekend was the ceremonial start and the restart. And the thing that's a bummer is that, you know, they set those trails weeks ahead of time. So all of those mushers were going out into about three feet of fresh powder, which means a lot of breaking trail and some really, yep. really hard work for them and the dogs. Yep. You know, this is why I think that I'm so still very like it, the coronavirus doesn't matter. It's because like Alaska's are such preppers. Cause you like didn't get to leave your house all weekend. Did you? Well, I left on Sunday and I will gripe about that when we talk about the coronavirus. <laughs> Cause you know, we're going to talk about the coronavirus again. Oh, I'm just disappointed. There's no zombies in the apocalypse yet. Right. That's what I keep saying. That's what I keep telling people. <laughs> um, yeah. So oh. I actually was not able to get out of my house until hubby did some serious plowing yesterday. And I actually got stuck on Sunday because the snow was so deep. Ugh. So yeah. And you have a truck. Like, well, I'm stuck I, in a truck. To be fair, I wasn't driving the truck. I was driving Tulip, my charger. Oh, okay. But I will tell you that car is heavy and that As car F. is all wheel drive and it gets around really, really, really well in the snow. I mean, I've had it for, oh my gosh, three years, four years now, and it gets around really well in the snow. So you this is the first time I've had that. this. Yeah, this is the first time I've had this kind of trouble with it. And it was just because the snow is so deep and the roads weren't plowed. It handles surprisingly well. So the, when I visited your house and I, I rented a Toyota Corolla because that's what I'm comfortable driving because I've driven one for over, you know, a decade. And I so I, w- I was like the roads were really, really sketch driving to your house. And then you're like, oh, drive my car. And I'm like, oh, God, I don't want to wreck Tulip. It was so much better yeah. driving in a heavy 
vehicle. It's a really even good if car. it was a car. I'm really happy yeah. with it. And by the way, a Facebook friend of mine shared with me that JDM just bought a brand new wide body Challenger, which is the Ooh. bigger, older, badder brother to Tulip. <laughs> so we have to make sure when we meet JDM this fall to compliment him on his really awesome car. <laughs> yeah, they. Um, I, I'm very scared for you when you drive home, but I know that like the Charger could take a hit from a Moose pretty well. Well, you know, and that's part of the reason I switched to that car. So I used to drive a, the Prius C, which is the small Prius. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's just not a good setup when you're potentially going to run into a moose. It's just not. I mean, at least I've got yeah. some chance of surviving it if I hit a moose in the Charger. No, I hit a deer in a 69 Ford Ranger, and that set me spinning. So <laughs> I, could not, I could not imagine a moose, except for they're, like, all leg. You just you have to no, speed up so that you, you throw them over. They're more than just leg. I actually have a friend who is a nurse who was in a moose versus car about two years ago and has not been able to return to work. Uh, you got to get them over the hood. Like you can't have them come through that windshield at you. Right. That's you take them out at the knee and, and you just got to make sure you're going fast enough that they fly over you. And, and for people who think we're being morbid, I mean, there's actually a lot of moose versus car up here where yeah. I am because they just come up out of nowhere. I mean, you it's it's really hard to see them sometimes and they're very fast and they'll just come onto the road very suddenly. So, you know, some of it is carelessness, but a lot of it is unavoidable. Well, I mean, the moose naturally kind of gravitate towards the uh the roadways when it's the snow is this deep. I was just going to say especially when yeah. the snow is this deep. Yeah, they don't have to trudge through it with their long legs so much, especially juvenile ones. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the Alaska Hour from Marnell and Diane. <laughs> I, I, will, I do have to say that moose are delicious, though. <laughs> uh, so some are, people aim for them. Some people what? Aim for them. Oh, that's terrible. That's not true. <laughs> no, you you can't keep roadkill. It goes to a charity if it's salvageable. Right, exactly. Um, so we are actually here to talk about The Walking Dead. We are. Season 10, episode 11. Morning Star. Morning Star. And I will be honest and say I did not pick up on the fact that what Daryl picked up with was a Morning Star until I watched Talking. Okay, neither did I because it's technically a flail. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, honestly, I went the religious route of Morningstar and I was like, well, okay, um, Ezekiel was laying like a crucified Jesus in the bed. And, okay, Jesus is the morning star. I know they say Lucifer is the I morning star. Say, but Jesus, I thought Lucifer was the morning star. Uh, Jesus is the morning star, and Mary is also called the morning star. Uh, so I've always heard we, Lucifer referred to as the morning star, because that's where my brain went. There's something right before morning star. It's like the, the shining morning star or something like that. But, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I did not. That's That's the... If that was really the only meaning behind the episode, I'm like, what was the big deal? It was a horrible weapon to begin with. Like, Well, and I didn't it, do any great Googling, so I don't have anything to really shed on, um, on Morningstar. No, I don't either, because uh, it was a flail, for one. <laughs> <laughs> two, like, that was, I mean, that's just a really unwieldy weapon. I can't... I can't see just picking that up and knowing how to swing it correctly and be accurate. And it's just, it's really heavy and it takes a lot of, of strength and control and the, like, I, give me, give me a, a poke and stick any day. Okay. So, um, in Anton LaVey's satanic Bible, Lucifer is one of the four crown princes of hell, particularly that of the East, the Lord of the air, and is called the bringer of light, the morning star. So you're going to make me find it again. Well, you know, I guess I just, I, I get my chops <laughs> from the satanic Bible versus the other Bible. So, 
right? <laughs> what can I say? That's where my brain went. Uh, let's see. There's a ton of stuff on the Morning Star. Um, uh, Jesus self-described as the bright Morning Star. How uh, Mary, interesting that we have Mary Mother. Go ahead. I just was thinking how interesting that we have such two different takes. Uh, it tells and you Mary, who the dark and morbid one is, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Both of us. We're just varying shades of gray most of the time. <laughs> Uh, Mary called the morning star in the litany of Loretto. Uh, and then, okay, the only other thing that I kind of pulled from it is um, in astronomy, uh, Venus is the morning star when it appears in the east before the sunrise. Well, they were talking, uh, Eugene and Stephanie were talking about the satellites. Uh, and I think they said before sunset. And they were actually talking also not just about satellites, but about stars. So right. that's right. a good, Shooting stars. that's a good thought. Yeah. That, that's all I had for, for that. Cause yeah, I yeah. got flail on my I, weapon. I'm there with you. I was the same way, but I did find myself wondering if it was going to become Daryl's new weapon, because I know that, that in seasons past, we've talked about how Norman Reedus kind of had some heartache around the crossbow, mm -hmm. you know, that it wasn't really his thing. And he kind of thought it was a dumb thing to, to be identified with his character. See, and I don't. I know. I like I, it. And most of us do. I like but, it. But, yeah. you know. Yeah, no. All right, so I know that you didn't like it as much as I did. I will go with Thomas O'Mara and say that I thought this was one of my favorite episodes of the series. I didn't dislike it. So I'm it was just a middle book. Give your rating first. Um, I will try not to swear in my rating, but I rated <laughs> it a, a four point one kinky whisperer stuff. <laughs> oh, he didn't say stuff. Very I good. thought that was a funny moment. What was your rating? My rating was 4.8 Portraits of Lost Comrades out of 5. Oh, yeah. that I did. The portraits, I've got a couple screenshots and I've, I, ha I might have some questions later. Ah, okay. I can tell you right away Herschel and Glenn, but those are the ones that I recognize the most. And I would have to go back and look at the others. Andrea and um, I think Rick. Ah, so, but there was a couple more. Really? Yeah. Huh. I didn't realize that it, that there was one up there for Rick. That one must be new because we've seen this wall of portraits before. I think it was Rick. Huh. Like, honestly, I thought it was Sadiq, but I was like, he just died. Nobody's had time to paint his portrait. You may have to send me your screenshots. I will try and do that right now. <laughs> All right, so I have a few numbers. So I mentioned last week that normally I look at TV by the numbers, and I don't know what's going on, but the person who hosts that ha is way behind. Um, <laughs> I couldn't find any numbers for any of the episodes for this back half of season 10, so I just did like a Google for Nielsen ratings for Walking Dead, and I found some stuff on Wikipedia about Walking Dead season 10. So the numbers that they gave us, and these look like they're same day numbers, were 3.52 million for Squeeze, which was the mid-season premiere, 3.16 million for Stalker last week, and then 2.93 million for Morningstar. Hmm. I would really like to get a hold of AMC's uh, online subscriber rating. Right. I mean, I, I think that's a very good point. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, we've talked a lot about how viewership has changed and about how you can't really rely on Nielsen ratings anymore. And I think that's true, but I have an interesting tidbit in, um, whisper, whisperer's corner when we get there that, ha okay. that goes back to the numbers. So, okay. So we already kind of talked about the title. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the writers. So it was co-written by Julia Rushman and Vivian Say. Um, both of them have written for 
Walking Dead before. Julia mm-hmm. Julia Rushman has two Walking Dead credits. Um, the World Before, which was the mid season finale for this this season, and then this one. Um, she has some AMC history, so she wrote quite a bit for The Sun, which was an AMC western with Pierce Brosnan. Hmm. And I, I, I remember that one. Yeah, I never watched it. I mean, I really was into Hell on Wheels, although although I didn't finish it. I still need to finish Hell on Wheels. Um, but I I. I kind of burned out on AMC Westerns after Hell on Wheels, so I did not watch The Sun. My understanding yeah. is that I really need to watch the new one with Kevin Costner, Yellowstone. I've heard really good things about that. Yeah, I think we've talked about that before. And, you know, nobody does, like, kind of Western-style stuff like Kevin Costner does. Um, <laughs> the Postman was a really underrated movie. I know that was kind of post-apocalyptic y, but it was Western y. You know, I didn't watch it. I loved Dances with Wolves. I still do. It's one of my favorite movies. <gasps> oh, so, that's right. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking at your picture. I keep saying um, which is really bad. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm looking at your picture and I do not recognize anyone other than Herschel Glenn and Andrea. I can't really okay. tell who the others are. I want to say that the guy on the upper left is supposed to be Henry, but you see what I'm saying about the guy on the lower right looks like Sadiq. Mm-hmm. I can see that. I don't think it is, but I can see that. And then the person up top is completely genderless to me. <laughs> well, you know, and the thing is, um, I think these are all portraits that we've seen before. I don't think there are any new portraits since the last time we saw the portrait wall, which I want to say was a couple of seasons ago. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't really have anything else to say about the portraits. Nothing illuminating. <laughs> no, me either. Okay, so Vivian Say um, has been a story editor, executive story editor on 16 episodes of Walking Dead. She has been a writer for three episodes. This one, Scars, which we both really liked, and Stradivarius, which we both really liked. Mm-hmm. So I would say both of these ladies can absolutely write for this series again. <laughs> <laughs> I was really happy with them. Yeah, like I said, I there is nothing that I disliked about this episode. It just it was a middle book to me. I feel like we're building towards, you know, the the climax of the season or you know, at least episode 14 and we'll talk about that. I think it's so funny that we're so that were so different that our, our views of this episode are so different because I really do think it's one of the best in several years. And I, I definitely think it's up there in terms of my ratings for the overall series. Okay. Like I watched it like two and a half times and like, I get like, it's super monumental that like Hilltop's gone. I mean, Hilltop is ashes. That's just, that's, it's monumental, but it just, I don't know, like, there was just a lot of, there was a lot of back and forth in this, and that, like, we tried to leave, and we couldn't, and we were fighting, and then we got stuck, and it, yeah. Oh so. my gosh, for me, there were so many amazing moments. I had a hard time picking my good and my <laughs> ugly. I really did. Good. And, and I, frankly, had a hard time picking a bad. Uh, I had a bad um it's not bad bad but yeah you helped me with picking my bad <laughs> okay. okay so oh God, do we have the same bad <laughs> no i don't think so we talked about it when i was talking okay. to you on my way home tonight yeah i know like that's when i decided my bad <laughs> so our director is michael oh go ahead it was really hard to pick a bad it was yeah so our director was Michael Satrazimus. I will not belabor him other than to say, and, and I don't think he's directing it, although he might be, we have an upcoming episode this season called Look at the Flowers. Mm-hmm. Which, episode 14, like I said, we'll talk about that. Which is a line from The Grove, which Michael Satrazimus famously directed. Mm-hmm. So a little bit of a tie in there. It'll be interesting to see if he directs Look at the Flowers. That would be really cool. Mm-hmm. All right. 
Featured cast. I don't have anything. I am so sorry. You told me that you would do a little feature on her, and I totally fell down because I was watching the episode again. And I'm home late because this is my late night at work. And you were moose herding. Right. Which means we're going to go for hours. Right. Um, So I chose Karen Cisse, who plays Birdie. Uh, very, she's a very, very minor character, but she's been in like 12 episodes. So, so tell us you have who, definitely seen her. Tell us who Birdie is. Tell us what she does. Is she the, like the nanny? No. Okay. Um, she doesn't really, she just, she's always kind of there. She's one of the Hilltoppers. Okay. Um, and a lot of people may actually recognize her from two of her other, um, acting gigs. She also is in the show Black Lightning. Uh, I've watched season one. She plays uh, Veretta Henderson, which is, I think, Captain Henderson's wife. I think he's a captain. Um, And so she gets to run around and kind of be badass in in that show. Um, She is also in season two of Stranger Things. She plays Mrs. St. Clair, one of the uh, parents. I did notice that she had a Stranger Things credit, and I thought, oh, okay, but I haven't watched season two. I've only watched season one. Well, of course, because she plays one of the parents, she's got a very minor role in that, but she says it is one of her her funnest uh, acting gigs because she does get recognized from it a lot, and she gets recognized by very young kids because it's kind of a young kid's show. Uh, not really, but kind of. <laughs> I was going to um, say, it's a little grim. <laughs> it is, it is, but, I mean, look at the stuff we were watching when we were that age. Well, that um, is why you are so messed up. It's also super fun because she grew up in the 80s, and now, so now she gets to, like, kind of go back and live that nostalgia on set. Mm-hmm. Um, but she is also in a show that she reminded me I need to go back and watch called Deputy. Uh, It's a new TV series that started in January, and it's Stephen Dorff as a sheriff. Oh, how interesting. I absolutely love Stephen Dorff, so I need to watch that. But it's kind of funny that um, Karen is in three big kind of horror comic booky shows because she's a fan of comedy. She, She... would would like to be in more comedy shows and and you know grow her comedy chops, but she is in three comic book horror type shows. Well, Walking Dead pays the bills, <laughs> right? <laughs> Walking right. Dead keeps the uh, lights on. She uh, started her acting career at about ten years old, and she started in music theater in Philadelphia, um, where she grew up. And she moved to Atlanta to go to Spelman College, where she got a BA in um, uh, theater. I was going to say dramatic arts, but theater. She has a husband who is a chef, and she loves to cook herself. Check out her Instagram, uh, at Karen Cisse. Also her Twitter, at Karen Cisse. And she actually keeps her Facebook up to date, too, so you can go like her on that. I warn you, on her Twitter she is an uber lefty, so if that's not your politics, then don't troll her. Don't troll anybody on social media ever, but don't troll her. Uh, but she does tweet a lot about politics. So Okay, I have to confess, I troll Susan Collins pretty regularly, and it gives me great <laughs> passive-aggressive joy. But she's the only person that I troll on, on social media. I post snarky gifts. That's about <laughs> it. Okay, I, I lie. She's not the only person. I've been trolling Matt Ga- <laughs> Matt Gates or Getz or however you say his name. I've been trolling him this Getz. week. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, dude, aren't you quarantined? <laughs> right? All right, sorry. I'm being uber lucky. I'll okay. stop now. So, yes, don't don't troll Karen on social media for her political views, but she does tweet a lot about politics. And I happen to agree with those, so I started following her on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I may have to follow her on Twitter. Right. Because you and I are the lefties and the, the only lefties in the family. <laughs> so anyway, her husband is a chef. She loves to cook. Her Instagram is full of 
amazing looking Southern food. I mean, if you didn't know she was kind of a Southern foodie, you would know it from her Instagram because it all looks delicious. It's barbecue and mac and cheese and and all that good stuff. Um, She has an adorable dog I could not find the name of. Um, But she also has a son who is a budding director. So she, um, yeah, he's kind of got an in with his mom, I would say. Um, she is very, very big in, um, women in film and women in the arts in the, uh, Atlanta, Georgia area. And she actually met a few of the actresses on The Walking Dead before she was on The Walking Dead. So, um, she had never watched the show or anything. And she actually says that, um, that was probably a good thing because her very first day on set, it was like full bore, uh, um, Andy Lincoln, Sonequa Martin Green, Melissa McBride, like all of them were there. And so she, it wasn't, it wasn't as intimidating to her as she thinks it would be now if she had been a fan of the show and gone on set and just like everyone was there. So, so. I find myself really hoping, and it's, it probably didn't happen because Anna, Emma Bell was on so early in the series, but I hope she met Emma. You know, I'm just I'm thinking oh, yeah. about I'm thinking about Nice Trick the movie, and I'm thinking about Emma's push for recognizing women in film. And uh, mm-hmm. it sounds like she and Karen would really dig each other. Yeah, I think so. Uh, on her Facebook, she has a she links to an article about um, the hashtag Pay the Artists, and it's about how artists are kind of get, getting screwed over um, because everyone thinks that oh, you know, you're exposure is your payment. You should just be happy that I'm featuring you, you know? Um, So yeah, that's kind of right up their alley. Okay. Uh, You might want to get on Twitter and tell her to hook up with Emma Bell. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Uh, So I do want to give a shout out to some guys at BMNY Deadcast on YouTube, because I got a lot of my info from them on Karen because they get a lot of um, actors and actresses from The Walking Dead on their YouTube show. So Very nice. Yes, go and check them out. If you uh, think about episode... it, put throw up a link for them on the Facebook page. On the oh, yeah, that's page. a good idea. Yeah. Uh, so it's funny. The episode that uh, featured Karen, uh, one of the guys was talking about going to one of the New York Comic Cons, and he was very, very excited to meet... Spider's own Kirk Manley. Nice. Yeah. So I thought that was a cute crossover and I had to give the guys a shout out for, cause they gave me a lot of info on, on, uh, Karen C. This episode. Very nice. I did my homework. You did. You seriously did your homework. <laughs> I was actually rewatching because I, had the luxury of just watching as a fan and not a podcaster on Sunday. And it was so nice. I didn't take any (laughs) notes. I didn't skip through commercials. I just let it play. And and I really enjoyed it. It's been a long time since I've done that. See, I think you and I are the opposite because I don't take notes at all on my first watch. All my notes come on second watch. You know, it totally depends on whether I think I'm going to get a second watch or not. And uh, frankly, I'm I'm doing so much right now and I'm working such long hours that I'm not always guaranteed a second watch. That's a really good point because we are podcasting on Tuesday again, which is a, a late day for you. And really late. I'm probably going to be up late and up early, but it is what it is. I'll sleep yep. when I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> From the coronavirus. <laughs> Well, and that, oh, it's so terrible that we joke about it. That kind of moves us right into the housewives' housekeeping corner, doesn't it? Sure. Okay, so I've got so much. <laughs> <laughs> My first thing is coronavirus appropriate greetings. I am a handshaker and I am a hugger, and this has been really hard for me. Like breaking the habit of walking into a patient's room. And shaking their hand, or ending the appointment with a hug, or beginning the appointment with a hug, depending on how well I know the patient. It's really hard. (laughs) So, I had some really funny posts on my Facebook page about appropriate greetings. Of course, people are talking about 
fist bumps, um, elbow bumps. Live long and prosper. Right. I've seen the the meme that shows Spock with the live long and prosper hand. Uh, but a friend of mine posted something really funny today. Please tell me it's that Mithers tweet. No, I'm not sure. But okay. So one of the things that I had read and I talked about it on my Facebook page was people are suggesting the namaste greeting, which is where you put your ah. hands together and bow. And uh, she said that in Tibet, it's actually appropriate to greet each other by sticking your tongues out at each other. And I was like, that's it. I'm sold. That is going to be my greeting from now on. I'm going to walk in a patient's room and stick my tongue out at them. <laughs> You do know that one of them is going to have sneezed two seconds before. <laughs> Droplet transmission. I'm just saying, I like <laughs> Bette Midler's idea better. Uh, Bette Midler says, what are you doing instead of shaking hands or hugging people now? I've just been kicking everyone that approaches me in the junk and screaming, not today, virus. <laughs> my postal carrier hates me. Oh, my God. That is hilarious. Oh, there's so many people I'd like to do that to since I can't shoot them in the head. It's not the zombie <laughs> apocalypse. All right. So in the in keeping with the whole COVID-19 pandemic, because now CNN has decided to call it a pandemic. Um, and it's a pandemic because CNN calls it a pandemic. No, and so like actually, it was, it was pretty interesting. I actually listened to a podcast that I'm going to recommend this this morning. And Sanjay Gupta actually covered why they decided to shift to the language of calling it a pandemic. Which, I, you know, there was some stuff that I didn't know about the definition of pandemic. So that was very interesting to me. So, um, recent podcasts, and I told you that I was going to hold out on the one that I think you would really like. So, if you're looking for some reasonable, not panicky coronavirus updates, there is a CNN podcast called Coronavirus Fact Versus Fiction, which is hosted by Sanjay Gupta, who is their chief medical correspondent and a neurosurgeon. The dude is no, no slouch. Um, yeah, he's pretty good. Yeah, he's pretty smart. And then there is one called Epidemic by Dr. Celine Gounder and Ronald Klain. And Ronald Klain actually headed up the Obama um, presidency's response to the Ebola virus. So yeah. I've seen interviews with both of them, and they're both pretty smart and pretty reasonable. So if you're looking for some non-panicky, thought-out responses to the coronavirus virus, I would recommend those. So the podcast that I think you're going to love, Todd told me about this. It is called okay. Uncover. It is a CBC production, so the Canadian Broadcasting Company. And I'm listening listening specifically to season six, which is called The Satanic Panic. Oh. So there was a little town near Saskatchewan. No, Saskatchewan is... is uh, a, they don't call them state, a territory, not Saskatchewan, uh -huh. in Saskatchewan near Saskatoon uh, that got swept up in the whole satanic panic like back in the late 80s, early 90s. Okay, so we I, I lived in Wenatchee when it, like, it happened in Wenatchee in like the early 90s, I think. Which is like a little yeah. late in the satanic panic, but it was still happening. Yeah. Yeah. So this podcast crazy. is messed up and they actually Which get a number right up my alley, totally up your alley. And they get a number of the people who were really part of the initial investigations, including several police officers to participate and people who were accused. They actually get some people who were accused to participate. So Oh I'm, my goodness. I'm really liking it. I'm going to tell you I'm three or four episodes in. Um, so I've got to get a little bit caught up, but uh, it's good. I'm liking it. Have you have you just listened to season six? Yeah, I have not gone back and listened to the previous seasons. I mean, they, they are about different things. So season six right. is specifically about the satanic panic. I'm not sure what the other seasons are about. Okay, so it looks like one of the seasons is Escaping Nixium. Which is oh, that, which is like this big cult. cult. I had I just Mac was in. So I just heard of them for the first time yesterday. I was listening to something what? about cults. I'm not kidding oh you. Oh my god! I'm not kidding you. There was a. I really... have seen like everything on on like Dateline ID. All of those. I've seen them all. 
Okay, so I totally need to learn about this cult because, of course, when I think Nexium, I think an acid reflux pill. <laughs> right, and it's, it's actually N-X-I-V-M is oh, how you spell it. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't oh. know anything about Nexium, so maybe that's the season of Uncover that I'll have to listen to next. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I have, I've been listening to a couple of podcasts. Um, I just finished one called The Dream. Um, it's actually a pretty short one. I think it's only about six episodes. Uh, and it's about multi-level marketing schemes. Uh, and I, I hate to call them schemes. Uh, but I mean, when you, when you listen to the definition of a multi-level marketing company, it's, it's, you know, it's a pyramid scheme and it's about, all about like, you know, the start of them and how, how they became popular again and everyone's selling LuLaRoe and, and, uh, Dutera and things like that. And color street nails. Hey, (laughs) (laughs) y'all. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have totally bought a ton of stuff from, and I'm not big on LuLaRoe, but like the nail things and a couple of other things I can't, I can't even name right now. But like, you know, if you sell for them, you're, you're not really selling the product. You're actually trying to get people to sell the product for you because you get income, you get upstream income. And right. yeah, it's, it was super, super interesting. And that actually um, parlayed me into a podcast, a true crime podcast called verified. Okay. And it is, I, I think it is in Amsterdam, this uh, police officer uh, rent his, um, a room out on an Airbnb type style, um, couch surfing app. And he, you know, he's the greatest guy and everyone trusts him because he's cop, a cop and he's got the blue check mark next to him. So he's verified, you know, like he's got good reviews and it turns out he's drugging and raping women <gasps> that stay at his Airbnb. Yeah, yeah. It's and of course these women are from all over the world, so like none of them ever really like put it together. You know, put, yeah, and so it's it's a team of women who finally group up and like take him down. So I'm, like episode four just dropped. Oh my gosh, so that's horrifying. It's called, yeah, it's called Verified, and it really, really makes you think about you know like. I'm getting in a car with a total stranger, which is what I was taught to do, not to do my entire life. And I'm sleeping in a room in a stranger's house or I'm sleeping in a stranger's house and it could be, you know, totally wired for sound and video. And it's just, it's makes you think it's creepy. Yeah. So maybe we're not going to take that Uber to Sonoy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We may just rent a car. Uh. All right. Um, um, any other podcast recommendations? Nope. That's what I got this week. Okay. I've got a couple of viewing recommendations and I am going to, I'm going to kind of qualify it by saying I have not watched either of these yet, but they come with really good recommendations. So one is a movie called Suffragettes on Netflix. Um, and Ooh. by the way, happy International Women's Day this weekend. And another one, it was an hour shorter. pardon, it was an hour shorter, right? <laughs> we won't even go there. <laughs> Although it was very light when I left work tonight, which was very nice. Um, oh, yeah. So another one is a series on Hulu called everything's going to be okay. Have you heard about that? No. So it sounds really great and I'm going to give it away, but a little bit away, but it sounds like, you know, this pretty early on. So it is a dad who's got an older son from his first marriage and then two teenage daughters from his second marriage. And he sits them all down and is like, I have cancer and I'm going to die. So the brother becomes the one who is appointed to be the guardians of the two teenage girls. And then happens the mayhem and hilarity. So it actually is supposed to be really funny. And I thought, huh, that might be a nice way to break up the trials of Gabriel Fernandez and the news. So <laughs> <laughs> so that is definitely on my list. That's funny. I almost thought you were talking when you, what was the title of it again? Everything's going to be okay. Okay. So there's a um, Netflix show that I just binged. Uh, called I Am Not Okay With This. Oh, I and have it, seen that. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty good. Uh, I really hope that it gets a season two because season one ended on a cliffhanger, but it's based on a graphic novel and it ends differently from the graphic novel. And the graphic novel's ending is very like final, like there's no coming back from it. So season, I hope, I hope I am not okay with it gets a season two. Uh, the girl that was in the updated Stephen King's it movie, she's uh-huh. in it. She, yeah, she's the main chick in it. So, which by the I way, just binged that. Have we heard any more about a second season for Black Summer? I mean, I know that there was some conversation around it. Uh, as far as I know, it was a go. Yeah, I think they were filming, but I don't know when it's going to drop. So, I am going to look at that real quick. Because that was good. I really liked Black Summer a lot. As we both talked about. Okay, season two, release date, cast trailers, updates. So it does look like Jamie King is in season two. Um, oh, so this says if Black Summer is back, you can can expect the following cast members. Um, looks like they're suggesting that it might happen sometime this year. Okay, Black Summer Season 2 is confirmed. Um, Interesting. So, Velez, this might be a big surprise to all the viewers, but the latest interview of Velez Jr., who plays William's character, um, might have just given some hope. Velez Jr. says we can compare his character to Jon Snow of Game of Thrones, and it might be possible that he could get a revival. His death was not clearly shown, so it could be possible. He also informed that the second season is is under production, so we need to wait to learn more about it. And this is... So... I have never heard of this website before. It's like Ota Kukart or something like that. It's really kind of a weird... But yeah, so there it is. I found filming Black Summer season two on the set starts full working day in 2020. According to one source, filming once again taking place in Calgary, Canada, Canada, with the filming scheduled to start January 6, 2020 and conclude February 4th, 2020. So, okay, so it should be in the editing. It should be in the can. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, a little tiny bit more in Housewives Housekeeping, and then we'll move on with it, because, oh my god, there's so much, and there's so much tonight, because, of course, we're podcasting really late. (laughs) (laughs) I can see my hours of sleep just draining away. Um, So, music. Um, I ran across a couple of really great things in music this week, courtesy of a couple of Facebook friends. So, Willie Nelson and his son, Lucas remade the song Just Breathe, which is one of my favorite Pearl Jam songs. Huh. It's amazing. It made me cry. And You'll have to put a link up to it. I will, because Lucas sounds so much like his dad. He's amazing. And so I actually, with it from the same friend, listened to a song with Lucas Nelson and his group, I can't remember what the name of his group is offhand, called Turn Off the News, Build a Garden, which is just a great, (laughs) it's a great song. So if I remember, I will put both of them up on our Facebook page because God knows we could all use a little comfort right now. (laughs) Right. And then I will just say, and this is the very last thing that I have for Housewives Housekeeping Corner Mo Collins has liked some of my tweets to her, <laughs> oh, <laughs> which is really nice. That's I did. Awesome. I told her she was one of the best things happening on this season of Fear, which I genuinely mean that. I love Mo Collins. Yes. So yes. I have. I very much enjoyed getting liked by her on Twitter. <laughs> That's awesome. So it looks like Lucas Nelson and the Promise of the Real. He has a great voice. I I am really liking him. And I'm not a huge country fan, but I'm really liking him. And you know what? Yeah, you say that and you say that like I say that, but I'm not a I'm not a country fan and I'm not a country fan of anything that's really new. Um there are a few things new that I'm okay with. Uh but it's it's 
old country that's that's the good country. Well, and I raved about that Ken Burns documentary about country music. And I, I just would go back to, I just really like things that, yeah, that have a little deeper root, that, that have a little deeper meaning. Oh, come on. You love the Dixie Chicks, Earl Has to Die. I do love right? Goodbye, Earl. That is one of the best songs or, yeah, ever yeah. made Earl. for country radio. <laughs> <laughs> My husband and I helped a friend leave a very unhealthy relationship right around the time that song came out. And <laughs> she just started referring to her husband, who thankfully is now her ex-husband, as Earl. <laughs> and I'm pretty she sure did not she... murder him. Huh? Hopefully she did not murder him. Well, I'm pretty sure she and I were really close to being Marianne and Wanda. <laughs> So, oh man, we could have done a whole other true crime podcast. Uh huh. Earl is lucky he made it out. <laughs> yep. Uh, all right, Whisperer's Corner. I actually have a fair amount in Whisperer's Corner this week. Okay. So, first, because I have started being more active on Twitter, Sonequa Martin Green and her husband, Kenrick, who we know as Scott on Walking Dead, yep. are expecting their second baby. Oh, and it sounds like they're having a little girl. I wonder yeah. how that's going to affect filming for her. I don't know. You know, she filmed Walking Dead while she was pregnant with their first. Remember, they just kind of bulked yeah. up Bob's jacket. So that's true. You can do amazing things these days. Amazing. Yeah, maybe look because uh, uh, Disco- uh, Discovery is, is still on, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My understanding is yeah. that it's, it's getting great reviews. I just, it's just one more streaming service I'm not paying for. <laughs> yeah, ditto. Although, I, I don't know. Even... I mean, I kind of feel like I need to because now they've got Picard on there too, so. Right. Mm-hmm. Maybe, um, maybe I'll get, uh, I'll, I'll get the streaming for like a month and binge everything like after it's all aired. So I have to wait a few months. Oh, speaking of new services and services that I'm not paying for, it sounds like Creepshow 2, or Creepshow, the new Creepshow, rebooted by Greg Nicotero, is getting a season two. Huh. They talked about that on Talking this week. Yeah, I think what I'm probably going to do is I'm just going to go the way of one of my friends. The way she watched Game of Thrones is she would wait until the end of the season and just get HBO for a month and binge the entire season. So you think you're going to do that with Shudder? Uh, I'll probably do that with Shudder and CBS. Well, you got to let me know what you think of Discovery and Picard. Okay. Because I, I did, I was able to uh, get the, like, I watched the first couple of episodes of Discovery and it was okay. I, it's, it's, it was a great show if it were not part of the Star Trek universe because it's pre-Federation and it just, it kind of blows it for me. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I'll be interested to see if that changes for you. Hmm. Maybe. Okay. Next up in Whisperer's Corner. So there was a little more about the trial, which is pitting, Kirkman, Gail Ann Hurd, and Dave Alpert against AMC for profits. Mm-hmm. And the thing that really shocked me about the article was not so much all of the stuff about the trial. It's still going on. It's just in its first phase. It sounds like it's going to go on for years at this rate. But Walking Dead has been so deeply in the red that there has not been any profit sharing since 2018. How can that be? Well, you know, I mean, we've gone from nearly 20 million viewers at, per episode to 3 million. But they have a whole streaming service now because of The Walking Dead, their yeah. number one show. I don't know, but they're saying this article, and I want to say it was LA Times, said that the series has been in the red and that there have been no profit sharing for the last two years. God, I just, I can't, I have a hard time believing that with, I, I mean, with all of the licensing of all of the stuff and with the advertisement time they can sell, I, you know, and far be it to me to judge. I mean, the show is probably really expensive to film. 
um, with all of our stars and all of the effects and everyone involved, I, you know, I, it can't be cheap, but I just, I can't imagine that they're not at least breaking even. Which, by the way, speaking of licensing, I agree with Greg Nicotero and Norman Reedus and Chris Hardwick that Kaylee Fleming needs to option the Norma Corn. The Norman Corn, yes. <laughs> oh, I would love to pick one of those up at Nick and Norman's uh, <laughs> restaurant. In Sonoy. In Sonoy. Yeah. All right. Um, so very quickly, I'll talk about Forbes, both Eric Kane and Paul Tassi. So Paul Tassi's article this week is basically who he thinks is going to survive the Whisperer's War. And he basically thinks that there are a lot of people who are going to survive. Um, he feels like Yumiko is probably going to take Michonne's storyline from the mm-hmm. Commonwealth because Yumiko is an attorney. And he thinks that Magna may take Dwight's arc from the Commonwealth. He really kind of feels like Ezekiel is probably going to di- Ezekiel will probably die in a heroic sacrifice, which I agree. They're really setting him up for that, especially with revealing his cancer to Carol and Daryl this episode. Yeah. Um, and he lists Daryl, Carol, Judith, RJ, Michonne, Connie, Eugene, and Negan as sure bets to survive. Hmm. I don't know. We'll see. We'll talk about who we think dies <laughs> later. All right. Uh, Eric Kane, you know, his article was just a, a pretty good recap of the episode. And his upshot was he felt like all told, all told it was a very good episode. So... <laughs> Excuse me. I really liked his um, perspective on the Eugene, Rosita, and Stephanie stuff. Okay, how Eugene ha- is have to elaborate. Okay, um, you know, and okay, it wasn't in my good bad directly. So uh, it was I or was not. Was, what's up? It was or was not. Oh, it was not. Okay. So I've been really down on Eugene for uh, his earlier interaction with Rosita this season. The whole friend zoning um, thing. Yes. And I was a little endeared to him for his little crush on Stephanie and the way that, like, all of a sudden he sort of sees Rosita as a cool older sister rather than a love interest. But um, Eric Kane pointed out that Eugene isn't thinking with the head on top of his shoulders and (laughs) he could be walking into a trap because he, you know, he's had to keep this hush, hush, hush. And he's, he's basically under Stephanie's spell and this could go sideways really quickly. Yeah. But if you've read the comic book. It doesn't go sideways, but you it know, doesn't in who's the comic to book. say that they're going to stick with the comic book? Exactly. Exactly. So I thought that was a really interesting take because normally I'm the one that takes the feminist perspective and is, is like really like, no, somebody's out to get somebody in this scenario. <laughs> and I didn't even think of it until Eric Kane pointed it out. Huh? Well, I disagree with him. I really like the whole Eugene Stephanie stuff, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more as we get to goods, bads, uglies, and rotting potpourri. (laughs) So uh, next, and we may have talked about this before, it kind of vaguely rang a bell, but just in case. So apparently a tweet that Kirkman sent out in January of this year supposedly confirms the origin of the zombie virus. His tweet was two, mm-hmm. two words, space spores. Mm-hmm. So I think it was tongue in cheek. I think he's messing with the fans. The person who wrote the article said that it's probably a nod to Romero because in the night of the living dead, there was some theory that a returning space probes radiation was what caused the zombies. So I don't know. I think it's Kirkman messing with the fans. I don't think we're ever going to get any more. He's pretty much been clear that he's not going to elaborate. No, look how much attention that tweet got. I think that was definitely just like, I'm going to mess with people. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I do like the idea 
of alien spores, you know, being the cause of a zombie apocalypse and maybe not the walking dead one. Um, because of course, one of my favorite big grade B horror films is night of the comet. And that was, you know, uh, the radiation from a comet created kind, kind of zombies. I would call them zombies, but I can yeah. honestly tell you, I've never seen it. But I'm guessing oh. right now, Steve is probably screaming, <laughs> going, yes, Night of the Comet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. You and I are going to have to do that in the off season. You, oh, me, no. Steve, and Diana oh, are my doing gosh. Night of the Comet. Diana, I'm just apologizing to you now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's 80s glory grade B horror. It's great. <laughs> All right, another thing for Whisperer's Corner, and you brought this up when we were talking earlier tonight. So Judith calls out to Daito on Mm -hmm. the radio, and I didn't realize it, but that's the name of a a Japanese sword. So the article that I I read that I ran across was talking about how basically it's a great code name for Michonne because it directly refers to her sword. Yeah. And that article was on... Oh, go ahead. That's a cool code name, by the way. It is a good code name. And yeah. and that uh, that is from Undead Walking. Do you want to talk now about who Alex is, or do you want to save that for Rotting Potpourri? Uh, we can save that for Rotting Potpourri. Okay, don't forget to bring that up, because I, that totally, been down. I totally missed that. Yep. All right, so... All of us has been thinking about the coronavirus, right? All of us have been saying, too bad it's not the zombie apocalypse. There actually is a link between the Walking Dead comic book and the coronavirus. What? Seriously. So the hospital where Rick wakes up in the comic book is a hospital called Harrison Memorial Hospital. There is actually a Harrison Memorial Hospital in Kentucky, and that is where the first confirmed case of COVID-19 just um just occurred in kentucky oh my goodness i know isn't that creepy (sighs) that is crazy (laughs) all right and the very last thing that i have in whispers corner and this is a bummer but i thought it was an interesting article so an actor who played a walker pretty frequently and it looks like he was a walker in season three um has been charged with assault for biting his British girlfriend. Oh my goodness. And he is actually in jail. I want to say, I want to say they said in Scotland. I can't remember though. They actually met at a Liverpool horror convention a couple of years ago. And it sounds like, you know, she had a pretty trusting relationship and he kind of built things up. And then when he got her alone, he didn't just bite her. It sounds like he was physically very abusive to her. Hmm. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah, so that really sucked. I was going to make a joke about not taking your work home, but that's not funny. Right. Yeah. And to all of you who are laughing, you're going to hell. (laughs) And we'll meet you there. Right. And the hot tub is in the hottest corner. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, don't don't hit people. Don't hit anyone. Like, guys don't hit guys. Guys don't hit girls. Girls don't hit guys. Nobody hit anybody. Okay. You know, don't bite unless it's a love bite and it's welcome. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, you can bite. You just have to have a safe word. Right. And it shouldn't be zombie. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, ma'am. Socks. Are... Make it sock. <laughs> <laughs> we are okay. an hour in and we're finally at our goods, bads and uglies. All right. Okay. You go, girl. My good, um, as much as we all hate Carol these days, and as much as I have, have hated on Lydia in the past, I really, really liked the scene between those two this episode. Um, it was just a very real conversation. Both of them needed a no BS, like not sugarcoated um, I love when Carol's like, you should hate me. And Lydia's like, it's kind of hard. You seem to hate yourself so much. Mm -hmm. And just like everything, you know, like Lydia's like, nobody's ever honest anymore. Like, you know, I'm sorry your son's dead and I'm sorry your mom's a monster. And just the whole conversation was great. And, 
you know, Lydia, Lydia's like, I, I don't think about you or I won't be thinking about you or something like that. When you and kill just, my mom, I won't be thinking yeah, about you. Yeah, I'm just, uh, the whole conversation was, it was great. I, I love that moment. I actually rewound it and watched it a couple of times just to kind of get everything in there. Um, so it was kind of a minor thing, but it made me not hate Carol for a minute. So I'm good with it. So I loved the way that scene ended where Carol says, you know, once upon a time I had a, a full life or a real life or something like that. And Lydia looks at her and says, yeah, I remember. Yeah. So, yeah. It seems like so long ago. This is not my good, but this is one of the things that I kind of struggled with not choosing as my good. There were so many good moments between characters. So many, mm -hmm. so many moments that were classic walking dead moments where I really felt like they built the characters just a little bit more. And that was one that was on my list. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your good? So my good, and I struggled not to make it my ugly, because you know I'm a giant Ezekiel fan, <laughs> was the Eze Ezekiel Carol hookup. You know, I was not okay with that in the beginning, but by the time they started talking about the dresser, I was like, all right, I'm into it. So the reason I was okay with it was it felt like there is finally some peace and some resolution and some grace before Ezekiel dies. Yeah. Because you know we're going to lose Ezekiel. It's just a matter of when. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, the only thing that could happen is he could go to the Commonwealth and they could have some sort of radiation or something right. that he could have <laughs> access to. You know, as much as I hate to lose the character and as much as I hate to lose the actor, I don't want to see them do that. I don't want to see them cheapen it. Yep. Absolutely. But... So for me, you know, there were a couple of funny moments, like when she looks at him and says, what do you mean we're going to die tonight? <laughs> and, and I really thought Ezekiel looked great in a sheet. <laughs> yes, yes, he did. But, you know, for me, more than anything, it was that that feeling that there was some closure between the two characters. That really meant a lot. Yeah, it was tough to watch them this season since since henry died like just he's almost kind of like what happened you know like he he was just left in such pieces it just it was really hard to watch that and then she, it was really hard to watch carol you know be be i mean i guess they both were fractured yes by they're henry both death. shattered absolutely just and in different ways kinda, yeah, and this kind of brought them brought themselves back together again, but together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was into it. All right, what was your bad? <laughs> Daryl's miraculous recovery. Oh, from last week? Honestly, he lost multiple pints of blood and, like, had, uh, like... Even if they were able to stitch that artery back up, he's not going to be limping around. Like, he's going to barely be out of bed. So wasn't no. Daryl's Miraculous Recovery your bad last week also? <laughs> or was it mine? I can't remember. I know it was Tom's. I, I, yeah, I just, I don't know if it was my bad, but it was definitely a an honorable mention at the very least. <laughs> um Mainly because we cleaned the we we cleaned and rearranged the office, and my notes are in a box in a corner somewhere from last week. So I couldn't get I didn't get to review my notes from last week. But yeah, I just I it's it's something we gripe about a lot on the show is how things that people should die for immediately they recover from so quickly, and then nobody ever dies of infection like. At the very least, like, in three episodes, he should be septic, you know? <laughs> and I, I think we've definitely outpaced our antibiotic stockpile at this point. Well, I don't know. Carol had a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> I did wonder about that. And I will tell you, this, this is not my bad, but I was like, where is Daryl still getting gas? Because I'm pretty sure they're not cultivating corn. Nope. Although they did yeah. have, well, no, so it looked like it was a cornfield that the that Adam, the Whisperer's baby, got left in, but we decided it was a sorghum field. Okay. 
So as far yeah, as I know, I mean, they're I... not making corn gasoline anymore. Yeah. the But you can kind of make ethanol from just about anything, can't you? I don't know. I don't know the first yeah, thing about I... ethanol. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. He should be on his last couple gallons. Right. I mean... All the cigarettes should be gone. Motorcycles get amazing gas mileage, but... I'm not believing it at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that is not my bad. What is your bad? So you and I talked about this, and it really doesn't have anything to do with the episode. Where's Michonne? <laughs> What's going I on think, with Michonne? I think technically my thing was where the hell is dog. Right. But then we talked about Michonne. <laughs> I, I would like to know where both Michonne and dog are. Yes. I mean, I, I do yes. feel like we are really due for the Michonne episode. So I was kind of wondering, like, is anybody going to come to the rescue? Is is uh, uh, Michonne going to come in and, and save uh, at least one of our groups? Like, we're going to probably split off into various groups next episode and get it scattered. Is Michonne going to come back and, like look for Judith or, or anything like that? Or is Maggie going to come in with like a whole bunch of people from the Commonwealth? Well, so Diane actually points out this episode that because all of the roads are blocked off, that certainly people from the other communities aren't going to make it to them in time to help them. Right. And I did think about Maggie because I thought, Oh my gosh, Maggie's going to show back up and the hilltop is going to be gone. Yeah. Okay, but see the roads being blocked off? Like, individ you can't get a car through there. You can't get one of those, like, horse-drawn car buggy thingies through there. But you can get individuals through there, and they walk to and from all the time. It can't be, like, the roads can't be the only way. You ha There has to be some, like, I don't know, Jeep or motorcycle trails or something. Or, I don't know, horse trails. You could unhitch the horses and ride there. Bouncing ideas off here, you know. <laughs> like we 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 could have got back to Alexandria just like we would have had to leave the cart behind. Well, I will tell you the thing that the blocked off roads did for me, and this is kind of a rotting potpourri thing, but I'll say it now. It hearkened back to the very end of season six when the saviors herded our group into the clearing, where ultimately we lost Glenn and Abraham. I mean, it very, oh. very much brought that feel back, and it was an intentional callback. So there was a YouTuber, and i sorry, I cannot remember the name of them, uh, but they actually pointed out that this the music they were playing when Daryl was like, the, the road's block, Negan's with him now, you know? Uh, they were specifically playing what he calls Negan music, which was what they would play when the saviors were around. Oh, uh, and they also played it when Negan was firing the fiery arrows. So I, I think we were meant to, I mean, Daryl shouted it out. He's like, you know, this is Negan's doing. He's joined up with them now. So, yeah, that was definitely a savior trick. So I will say there were a couple of great musical moments where I really felt Bear McCreary's influence again. And I have them written down in my writing potpourri. Okay. Um, Mouse just got up in my lap. So, hey, everybody, Mouse says hi. <laughs> <laughs> and she's doing really good. She's really fat. She's got a lot of hair and she's getting around okay. So, you know, Aww. yeah, my little mouse. She sleeps on the bed like 20 hours a day, though. She's hilarious. <laughs> I get home, she comes out and greets me, and then she's like, put me back up in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how I like to live. <laughs> All right, so tell me what your ugly is. Um, so I don't know how to feel about Daryl forgiving Carol. Like I said, my good in this episode involved Carol, but I'm really, really mad at Carol still. And I just, there was a lot of redeeming moments for Carol in this episode, but I'm still, I mean, Connie and Magna are still missing. But did so, he really forgive her? He just said he couldn't ever hate her. That's I a good point. I don't think he forgave her. I think she's still on the hook. I think he just was like, 
you're my person. I will always love you. But right now I'm not letting you off this easy. Yeah. Okay. This is why it was my ugly is I'm like, I don't know how to feel about this. I don't know. Like it's, it's really the wrong time to try and seek. For, I mean, I guess it's exactly the right time to seek forgiveness and that you, you one or both of you may die in a few hours, but like, it's exactly the wrong time to have a deep heart to heart about what you've done. I was okay with it. I mean, I, I just, I thought there were some really amazing moments between two characters throughout the episode. And, and that again was one. Yeah. And you know, I don't know. I don't know whose graves he was staring at when this, that interaction happened, but it kind of reminded me of her staring at the portraits. So I think they're probably the graves of like Glenn and Abraham and now they're just uh, really, really worn down. But they're in Hilltop. But Glenn and Abraham were buried in Hilltop. Oh, I thought Glenn was buried in Alexandria. Mm -mm. No, Glenn and Abraham were both buried in Hilltop. Okay. Because that's okay. that's where Maggie went. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that is where... Um, oh, my God. I'm blanking on Sinequa Martin Green's character's name. Sasha. That's where Sasha went and took... Abraham's body. Okay. Yeah, so I okay. think it was those graves. Huh. And and they are just weathered. I mean, it's many years since we lost those characters, so... Yeah. It's just that she was staring at portraits of dead people, and he was staring at graves, so... Mm -hmm. They both were kind of in the same mindset this episode, and, and I don't know. I, I don't think either one of them are going to die... I don't think I supposedly two people die next episode. At least that's what we're meant to think by the talking dead. By the two guests on talking. Yeah. So, um, but I don't think it's either of those two. So I think we will get more of a heart to heart later. And especially if, when, if, and when we ever do find Connie and um, Magna. So that was my ugly. I just, I, I didn't know how to have the feels about that. <laughs> what well, was yours? Of course, my ugly was a good ugly because I loved this episode so much. It was the battle. I ah. loved the way it was shot. I loved the way that it looked. The characters looked very medieval. Uh, I think it was Eric Kane who said it was more GOT than TWD. <laughs> <laughs> I actually felt like it brought to mind the 300 mm, yep. because our heroes were very much like the Spartans. They were outgunned, but they were still amazing. You know, and I think we talked about that at the mid season premiere when they were doing all of the formations then. Uh, when they were doing the season premiere. Or was it the season premiere? Mm -hmm, it was the season premiere. Man. Yeah. Feels like yesterday. Um, and so that was actually one of the things that I really liked. Also, I, the visuals were amazing. We got the return of the shield wall. All of our heroes were kind of highlighted fighting with their different weapons. The pitch bombs were horrifying. Right. And I love the way that it ended with that shot of Daryl's back with the new wing on his vest. I just I thought that was a really iconic image. Yeah. Like, I'm looking right now at my poster of Rick riding the horse down that highway into Atlanta, and I could see sitting, I, I could see hanging next to it that image of Daryl with his repaired vest staring at what Hilltop has become. Oh, I think Kirk Manley needs to need to commission <laughs> something new. There you go. There you go. So that was my ugly. I just, I thought the battle was great. I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the battle next episode. I definitely agree. We're going to lose at least one of those two special guests, if not both of them. Yeah. Um, and I think Ezekiel is going to go out in a blaze of glory. So I absolutely thought the pitch bombs were genius. And I, I believe those were bladders, weren't they? They were like animal so bladders. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was just genius. And I'm like, okay, why didn't we think of that? Because Rosita had moonshine. Like, why didn't we have Molotov cocktails? Right. 
Or was it because we don't want a bunch of flaming walkers walking around? There could have been that. But I'm just, yeah, that was that was a stroke of genius, mad genius. Yes, we're not as devious and cruel as the whisperers are. <laughs> right? And then, of course, like living in the Northeast all of my life, like, I, I, and the I Northwest. know this. <laughs> the Northwest, sorry. Um, I know this, that like, there's tree sap that flows like that, but that tree sap doesn't flow like that here. Like it's way more viscous. Like, well, it's because it's a lot colder here. But that's, that has to be what it is. I mean, yes, we do get 90 and hundred degree temperatures here, but like I, the, the sap in the trees never gets that liquid. Like, uh, and so I just, I, that would have never sprung to mind to, to make tree sap Molotov cocktails, you know? Uh, but yeah, that was pretty cool. Devious and horrifying. Right. All right. Oh. We are totally into rotting potpourri. We are into rotting potpourri. So before I forget, uh, when uh, the gang got to Hilltop and uh, Aiden and, or Alden? Alden. Is it Aiden or Alden? I think it's Alden. I think it's Alden. Alden and Earl were like, who's that chick talking about Mary and why is she here? And they were talking about, Oh, she, you know, they're bringing everyone here to see Alex. And then later on, there was another discussion about Alex. And I was like, who the heck is Alex? So for those of you who were in the same boat as me is who is Alex? Alex was a nurse in Alexandria under Sadiq and the whisperer guy. Uh, Dante. Dante. Uh, he was a nurse under those two guys. And now he's the de facto medical professional for the communities by default. <laughs> I, I am so glad you figured that out because I had no idea who Alex was. None. Yeah. Zero zilch. Yeah. So we haven't seen Alex yet, but I'm pretty sure he's going to die soon because he's the medical person. <laughs> <laughs> and is, it, is it he or she? Uh... You know what? I I believe it's a he. I believe it is a he. I will All have right. to do some Googling, but I, I think I remember a guy named Alex. <laughs> so, yeah, I was confused. Like, it, I had to actually rewind a couple of scenes because my mind was wandering so hard going, who was Alex? So, that's Alex. We may or may not see him in the future. He may, I don't know, he may be treating some burn scars or I don't know. Or he could die in the conflagration that is now Hilltop. Okay, somebody died because there was a Hilltopper who got set on fire and they weren't even in the memoriam. So, like... Okay, it had to have been Alex because Alex is the last <laughs> medical person. So Right? <laughs> oh, We're terrible. We are. So, what is Negan's game? You really want to know? Yeah, I really want to know because I am I am not sure that I know. And I was really angry with him this episode. And I thought that is proof positive that I got sucked in hook, line, and sinker to the whole redemption arc. So there are various places, both uh, in print and on YouTube. Wait a minute. This uh, is a spoiler. One... You need to give people a fair warning. Okay, this could possibly be a spoiler. This is the big, big theory of why Negan is a whisperer. Okay, so fast forward, like, what, a minute? If you don't want to hear the spoiler, two minutes? Sure, like, minute and a half. Okay. Minute and a half, two minutes. Okay, so the theory, and comicbook.com, I think, covered this, uh, is that... Remember when Negan got let out of his cell and nobody really knew who did it? Mm -hmm. everyone thinks it was Carol and Carol let Negan out of his cell to get in with the whisperers to, so that he, uh, he could like trap alpha or, or somehow capture her or get her in a place in time where Carol could kill alpha. That has been the sole driver for Negan all along. Now, I don't know what Negan's getting out of this other than getting out of his cell. But when you think, oh, no, Carol would never do that because Negan's a bad guy. Who does she hate more? Negan 
or alpha? Oh, definitely mm-hmm. alpha. Right? So I I think I could see her forgiving Negan or giving him a pass or making some sort of deal with him to get to alpha. I mean, what else could be driving Negan? I mean, if if it's not for Carol to kill alpha, then it's for his own I'm going to kill Alpha. So. Well. That's that's the going theory online right now. There has to be something beyond his squicky relationship with Alpha. <laughs> there definitely does. Because I cannot see him wearing a mask. And there's a little bit of a, a thing in the trailer for the next episode where he they're in the field with all of the dead bodies and every everything excuse me and um you know everything's still smoldering and he actually swings his bat at something on the ground and i would imagine it would be a walker's head well whispers don't do that whispers don't brain the horde you know Mm -hmm. so there's still something in him That maybe he sees someone from Hilltop who is turning, you know, who's dead on the ground and is turning. And he's just like, there's still, you know, something in him that's like, "Mm, no, I don't want them to be part of the Horde. Well, I don't know what the heck Negan's game is. It'll be really interesting to see. I hope they resolve it before the season's over. I do, too. Um, I don't think we're going to get it next episode. I think we're going to get it in episode 14, which is look at the flowers. I, you know, I mean, that's a reference to a kid being killed. So I don't know what that means. So let's see. Yeah, we've got quite a few kids, but nobody that I think will die other than maybe Lydia. Maybe Lydia tells Alpha to look at the flowers. <laughs> Maybe Carol tells Alpha to look at the flowers. Right? Yep. I could I could see that. So who do you think is going to die? If you had to choose two people, who do you think it is? Okay, well, I've already said Ezekiel, which is kind of a cop-out because we know he's dying anyway. But I, I agree with the theory that has been posed by other people, not just Eric Kane, that he's going to go out in a blaze of glory. Um, I'm concerned that Aaron is on the chopping block. Ooh. And I wouldn't be surprised if we lost Carol. You and I have totally different mindsets about this. Okay, so who's on your list? I kind of think that it, one of them is going to be Rosita. Oh, yeah. Well, that's right. And because we know that Rosita, we know that the actress is doing the Selena. Yeah. And there was the whole, I I really hope you get to meet her. And Rosita's like, finally, like her and Eugene have kind of finally made peace. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, Coco's with Gabriel. And uh, like, yeah, I I think Rosita's going to be one of them that we lose. And at first... I thought the other person we were going to lose was going to be Gamma, a.k.a. Mary. Mm-hmm. Um, just And that was because of what we see on some of the, on the next episode of. Um, I thought maybe she's going to be the one to go. I really hope not because I really like Thora Birch and I would like to see her integrated in our community. But it was pointed out that um, Nadine Marissa... Uh, a.k.a. Jerry's wife, Nabila. Nabila. Yes. She posted on Twitter on March 8th, just know I love all of you and have, and have enjoyed the ride. No! Not I, Nabila! I think she accidentally posted a week oh, early. Oh, no! I, I kind of, I don't want it to be because it's Jerry's wife. And right. Yeah, but like, oh man, if you post that on your Twitter on The Walking Dead, like, you know what we all think. You're going to be on In Memoriam. Oh, yeah. So, oh, that yeah. is super sad. So now, now my going bets are Rosita and Bila. Okay. And only because 
of what she posted on Twitter. Yeah, that's pretty much a dead giveaway. Mm, yeah. Oops, week early. Yep. <sighs> All right. Um, I am going to tell you about the things that I really loved. Like the scenes that I had a hard time picking between. Okay. So, you know, I talked about the moments between Ezekiel and Carol. I thought the moment between Eugene and Rosita was amazing. Like, especially when he gives her a kiss on the cheek at the end. Yeah. I just, I feel like there was some resolution there. So that's yep. a good point. That kind of points toward losing Rosita. Yep. Uh, I agree with you that the Lydia and Carol moment was amazing. The moment where Ezekiel gives Lydia Henry's armor. Henry's armor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Um, the moment between Daryl and Ezekiel when they kind of finally bury the hatchet after all these years. Yeah. And yeah. then and then the moment between Daryl and Judith. I mean, there were so many great, like character to character, character growth moments. They I just loved it. Yeah. I mean, even Alden and Mary, you know, about, mm -hmm. um, oh, what's the little boy's name? Adam. Adam, you know, just that it's going to be one of us that has to raise her and yeah. Yeah. Or him. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely agree. There was also a, I was, again, I'm going to have to go back and like credit some of these YouTube guys. Cause, uh, one of them pointed out that the, mirror that Ezekiel was staring in when um, uh, Daryl was coming down the stairs behind him was the same mirror that um, ah crap what's his name red hair mm. <sighs> he directs a bunch of the episodes now oh Michael Cudlitz Michael Cudlitz uh, I was getting confused because I was looking at Michael Satrazimi's name and I was like that's not him um, uh, was the same one that he was staring into um, a couple episodes, I think, before he died. And he was um, playing with the um, the busted taillight, I think, that Rosita gave him. Really? Remember the necklace? Yeah, yeah, but I'm the memory that I'm flashing on is him sizing himself up in that Marines uniform. Oh, no. No, I, I'll have to find the YouTube video and send okay. it to you. Um, it's the same mirror that he was staring into. But now, when Ezekiel was looking into it, there's actually a portrait on the stairs. And it's very a very orange and red portrait. And so we're thinking it might be his in memoriam portrait um, that's on that staircase. And it was just, it was kind of a, a odd callback to to that character in that time. And hmm characters that look into that mirror and then die a few episodes later. <laughs> I, I'm just thinking, you know, there were a lot of references to characters that we lost, like looking over those graves and seeing those portraits and, and, you know, Alden and Earl talk about Tammy Rose and about mm -hmm. losing Enid and. Yeah. And then Henry's armor. Mm hmm. Yeah. Henry's armor was a big one for me. I was, that was really unexpected. It was pretty cool though. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, and you know, when, she, when they were talk when Carol and um, Lydia were talking, she was going over the little um, H plus L mm -hmm. part, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like I said, this, this episode was kind of a middle book for me because it was, it was doing exactly that. It was, it was reflecting on what had happened and it was building up to what's coming. So, oh, but it was so rich. There was so much. There was. Okay. One, one part that I really, really appreciated because I wouldn't have thought of it, but once they showed it, I was like, Oh yeah, that's totally how it would happen. The rats. Oh yeah. Uh, oh. So, so hubby didn't watch it on first watch. He watched it with me tonight and he was like, Oh, that's bad. Right. Mm -hmm. I would never have thought of that, but yeah, yeah that was a rats. really nice way to show that the horde was on its way. Yeah. And then Kelly, uh, putting her hands to the ground and feeling the, the, the you vibration. Know. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was the little thing this episode. Okay, so we haven't talked about it, but I'm going to because actually Mouse is like, all right, I need to go out. So wrap it up, people. <laughs> um, Eugene has a great voice. Oh my God, he's got a great voice. And that song was perfect. I would have never pegged it as an Iron Maiden song. Me either. But the lyrics were really appropriate. Yeah. So I actually had it on closed caption this time and it got recorded with closed caption, which was really nice because I feel like I didn't miss anything. Oh, and the other thing I want to say about the battle scene, for once, it was not too dark. Okay. And I was going to say... It was um, great. It was perfect. It was night. It was scary. It was well shot and it was not too dark. I didn't feel like I was missing anything. Uh, it looks like in the next episode, because you can see the first like two to five minutes online right now. Um, and it's it starts out where we left off right at the battle. Um, and it does look like it is brightened up. And um, I want to say it actually looks like it was brightened up in post production. Like they they legitimately filmed at night and then added some lighting in the after effects. Uh, but it does look like we get a lot of the scenes um, a lot more visible than they have been. So they are taking our complaints to heart. I, I'm just incredibly glad because it made it so much more enjoyable to watch. Yeah. I didn't feel like I was struggling to figure out what was happening in the action. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, I really liked that Ezekiel's cancer got revealed to two really important characters. I feel like that's been something that has needed to, to come to the forefront for a long time. Yeah. It, it's tough because it's, it's one of those things where like the, I feel like the more people that know about it, the closer his impending death. Huh? Next episode. If we're both right. right? <laughs> Jerry's uh, going to be heartbroken. Yeah. I mean, between losing the king and his wife, Jerry's going to be heartbroken. You know, I I think he would rather go out in a blaze of glory than slowly have the cancer eat away at him. So I agree. That's how I will deal with that death. If and when it happens. Uh, there was a nice moment, too, and this is a small moment, but when Daryl is, is talking to Judith, he says to her, you shouldn't have had to see, you shouldn't have had to have seen the bodies like that. Yeah. And I thought, that's really cool. He's trying to preserve some scrap of a childhood for this kid who's never really had a childhood. No, uh, Yeah. Um, scenes from next time, though. Yeah, we know that Judas is not going to follow orders, right? Right. Yeah. <sighs> Man. Oh, by the way, like the horde coming at you is like super terrifying, but then having them whisper, we are the end of the world, like all of like. <laughs> or that's... what else was it? We take them all. Yes. Like that was horrendous. That would be terrifying. It was. Yeah, I, I definitely am feeling a lot of loathing for the Whisperers. Uh, Beta's role in this episode was super interesting because uh, the Alpha is spending a lot of alone time with Negan. And Alpha was sort of, or Beta was sort of relegated to like, you know, go collect tree sap. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you feel like he's got to be getting really angry? Yeah. Because I he's would really be. pretty much been replaced by Negan. He's been ousted yeah. by Negan. Yeah. And, and Negan is just loud and cocky. And yeah. And I was going to say, of anybody to be replaced by the absolute antithesis of what you stand for, you know? Which, by the way, the mask and all the, the talk about the mask on talking was really pretty cool. I didn't see it so much on the first watch, but definitely the second watch, I was yes. like, I see the Joker smile. And I see Daryl. And you see Daryl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's so funny because that's the two overarching themes that they have had this season are um, Cold War tactics and slasher film. 
And if anybody knows their slasher films, they know that Michael Myers masks, it, mask is just a William Shatner mask painted white. Oh, I think I remember that vaguely, but I would have never pulled that out of my brain. Yeah. Good for so you. They were just like, we're going to take a Norman Reedus mask and make it a walker or a whisper. Good for you. I'm always good for slasher movie uh, <laughs> trivia. Oh, night of the comet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my girl, do you have anything else? I think that is it for now. I think we are a good hour and a half in, and I think Mouse is like, I want to drink a water, I want to go pee, and I want to go back to bed. <laughs> pretty much what I want to do, but I'm going to wash my hands first. I am going to edit the podcast and get it up tonight because I'm going to be a good girl. Oh, uh, you're so good. Are you going to blog? Um, I'm not going to blog tonight, but for anybody who is interested, I am going to do a blog about sexual health this week. Oh, because I really had a freaking phenomenal moment with a patient today where I really felt like I made a difference in this person's life. So... Okay, and it was not because of what you're thinking? <laughs> I am not sure where your brain is going, but it sounds like your brain is not going to a good place. Well, I know the story, and I went, wait, I'm sure that got people scratching their heads. <laughs> it's more going to be encouraging you to talk about your concerns with your provider. Yes. Because we really can make a difference. Always be honest with your medical professional. Yep. They've heard it all. They really have. Absolutely. And we've seen most of it too. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> Everyone just remember. Take, take it, it. One. one dead, dead. Day. At, at a time. time. And wash your hands. And don't shake hands. I'm trying not to. <laughs> All right, everybody. Stick your tongue out at people instead. (laughs) (laughs) 